Greetings, Slashaholics, and welcome to another episode of Outer Print Slashers. I am Sean Campbell. I am joined by the 80 Slasher Librarian, Josh LaRue. How are you doing tonight? Doing pretty good. I keep, you know, I keep wearing this hat, and it's just about ready to be retired. It's, it's, it's in pretty bad shape. <laughs> I've had it since, I think, our first episode. So, uh. Yeah, but, you know, you can't buy it from your store, right? Yeah, it's not, yeah, there's no, there's no hats on the store. This was made for me by somebody, so. Uh, no, no, I was going to say, because you can't get high on your own supply. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You ruined you're my punchline, because you're like, we don't even sell hats. My bad, my bad. So what are we talking about tonight? I was like, spoil it with, with that. <laughs> I had to, I had to d- dust off the 80 slasher librarian mug. I've been keeping colored pencils in it on my desk. Hey, if as long there as might be some shavings in here, I think I'll be all right. As long as you tell, tell myself it's coffee grounds. Yeah, you're looking pale. You could use a little color. So there you go. That was a dad joke. I'm fired. <laughs> all right. Well. Tonight's uh, episode is going to be Friday the 13th, Part 3. Not the Simon Hawk version. This one's the Michael Avalon version, which is closer to the original script. Um, judging, judging this book generally, um, it's really close to the movie. Uh, the only thing that's different is the... I mean, not the only thing, but there are a few differences here and there, but the main differences are at the ending. The ending is a lot different, and... I, I, I would have been really interested to see where the series would have gone if they had used the ending in this book. Where could it have gone? You know, I mean, we're going to get to that. We're not going to give it away yet. But, yeah, I mean, they would have had to go with the uh, copycat killer a little sooner, you know. Well, not not just that. I mean, you got to consider, um, you know, they didn't think Friday the 13th was going to get off part one because his mom got beheaded. So. You know, if, if something like that happened again, it, it makes you wonder who would pick up the mantle because there there was the mom, then there was Jason. Well, that could have been prime time for Elias Voorhees to come in and start killing, just complete the complete the Voorhees set. Or Jason's twin brother, Joshua, since that was what his name was supposed to be in the first movie. Yeah. I'm sorry. That, that, is that too... Uh... That's too jumping the shark, isn't it? That he would have had a twin brother out there somewhere. I don't even know how to respond to that. So I'm just going to continue on with uh, what we're talking about. Uh, so, yeah, um, w- there are going to be some spoilers in this video. Um, we will announce those when they happen. It's kind of hard to talk about how this book wraps up without talking about some key plot points. But for the, for starting out, we'll just kind of go through the book um yeah just because you've seen part three doesn't mean you know this book completely because it is based on the original script not the shooting script like the simon hawk one in fact the book is actually called friday the 13th 3d by michael avalon there's nothing 3d about it you know but that's actually what they called the book so was the hockey was the was the because it's not a hockey mask in this book it's a nondescript white mask but is the is the mask on the front cover supposed to be the mask they were going to use because I know how they this is part three they hadn't got to the hockey mask yet yeah. so they have this weird white it oh, it, it kind of looks like a goalie mask but not quite it has it has a lot more holes in it and it's definitely not your the typical hockey mask that yeah. got chosen later on. Yeah, it's kind of like the uh, VHS cover for uh, uh, Friday the 13th 5. You know, it's yeah, like yeah. a hockey mask. I think what I pictured when I read this book for the mask was kind of like the mask that Shelly is wearing in the movie, early on in the movie, like at the beginning, but just white. You know, it's yeah. see-through. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically, when you pick this book up or you listen to the audio book I did, a lot of it, you're like, ah, oh, okay, this is just part three. This is like the Simon Hawk version. But it's the, it's the differences that really make this one special. Because I've narrated both of them, and I didn't feel a lot of deja vu or, oh, my God, I've already done this. There's enough stuff different. Even some of the character traits and stuff are a bit different uh, in this version compared to that. Shelley's not as big of a pushover 
in this original script as he is in the movie. I mean, he's still a pushover, but he's not as big of a nerd, I guess is the word I'm looking for. He's a little more assertive uh, with the, with the girls, um, kind of creepily at one point, but, uh, the biggest thing is this Jason Voorhees is a plotter. He's planning, he's setting traps, he's stalking. Um, he's kind of doing a Michael Myers thing really. And they're uh, schemers trying to control their little world. There you go. Joker says it perfectly. Um, yeah, favorite Joker, favorite Joker, Joaquin or, or him? This sounds like a cop out, but I think each Joker brings something special to the table in all their movies except Jared Leto. <laughs> Jared Leto was just a bit too weird for me, but I think I liked all the other Jokers. Gun to your head, though. Somebody's like Heath Ledger, Joaquin Phoenix, Jack Nicholson, or Mark Hamill. Who's the best? Or Cameron Monaghan. You're forgetting about, um, I forget what his name was, Cesar Romero. Uh, he's he's a good joker, but he's more of like a cartoony. Even Mark Hamill wasn't that cartoony, and he was a goddamn cartoon. I have to go with Mark Hamill. I mean, Mark Hamill breaks down the different kind of laughs for the moods that the Joker is in. I mean, he really dug into that character. Um that's get, that's getting off topic. That, that, that's more like after the slash stuff. Well, it's funny that we brought up laughing because let's start with that. Oh, <laughs> full circle, right? Exactly. Uh, see, what we say on here isn't just random bullshit. Uh, Jason laughs in this book and not a little smile when he takes the mask off like at the end of the movie. He straight up giggles with delight, you know, cackles hysterically. At scaring these teens and killing them, uh, you know. He, he laughs as he peeks through the window and judges people based on the color of their skin. That is true. This Which is, is something I, I couldn't tell if that was the writing style or Jason really thought that about the different people walking into the house. It, it was really hard to tell if it was like racist Jason or that was just the way that the author was trying to show that Jason doesn't see people, he sees shapes and colors and sizes and stuff i i don't it was just a little uncomfortable <laughs> it was uncomfortable you know anytime he was talking about boxy and then or you know from his perspective which we did get a lot of his perspective in this book that is another thing uh, i liked about it there was a lot of the cutting to he lurked in the shadows behind the curtains i mean there's a part where he's hiding behind the curtains while the people are in higgins haven you know, and it's like, why did he not just burst out and kill him then? You know, it's like he's stalking them and biding his time. Jason, you've never seen this in the movies, him biding his time and stalking his prey. In fact, should that be our first clip? Let people kind of hear, you know, stalky Jason hiding behind the curtains. Yeah. Okay. Roll it. Here, he said, taking his keys out of his jacket and tossing them to her. Take my VW. Chris had begun to cry helplessly. They all gathered around to comfort her. Vera stalked from the room, her tigerish figure swaying in rhythmic allure. Shelley stood mute, a helpless fat man seeing the scorn in all eyes. The red smears on his face were truly ludicrous now. His bad joke had laid an egg all over Higgins Haven. Minutes later, outside where the barn doors were wide open, Vera Sanchez eased the Volkswagen Beetle into the driveway, pointing its nose out toward the rickety bridge. It was a rusted-out old car whose engine made more noise than a boiler factory. Vera didn't care. It would be good to get away for an hour. Enough was enough. Suddenly, the fat figure of Shelley came racing out of the home. Cleaned of all his corpse makeup and blood, Shelley's face was a portrait of desperation. He caught up with Vera as the VW gained the old bridge. Shelley, running alongside, shouted through the window at Vera, Let me go with you, please! I gotta get away, too! Without a word, she floored the pedal and zoomed away from him, leaving him forlorn. But then, amazingly, the VW lurched to a full stop, and the side door swung open like an invitation, only yards away. 
Elated, Shelley bolted for the car and climbed in when he got there. The VW took off once more, zipping for the dirt road that led out to the highway. Vera drove like a racing car addict. From the curtained windows of the house, the massive form looked out, seeing them leave. A quiet laugh filled the gloom of the upstairs living room. The stranger in the midst of all these young people bided his time. It was still daylight. The hours would pass soon enough and this creature, whoever or whatever he was, was waiting for the night when darkness would fall and all sorts of terrible things were more likely to happen. The dark was a friend of this massive figure who was not a practical joker like Shelley. No, not at all. I would have loved that. It'd been like a Scooby Doo episode. They come in, they see some boots for under the curtain. It's like Scoop. I think there's, I think there's a killer in the house. Oh my god! What situation parties? I think they actually did that on Robot Chicken because I remember that Jason chasing through the house, and I think Velma unmasked Jason or something at the lake. Uh, it's, I, remember, it's, I remember that being funny. It's it's. Uh... It's old man Burns, the paramedic. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, um, one thing I noticed in this book is that um, when Harold and Edna get killed in the beginning, the Simon Hawk version goes a lot more into their backstories about what Harold did for a living, what Edna did for a living before they became just this, you know, old couple running a little store by Crystal Lake. But in this version, there are random parts of this book that will actually go to the cop investigation of them trying to track down the killers of Harold and Edna, which we didn't really get in the movie because in the movie they got killed and then you never go back to them. But it would have been interesting to see the cops trying to put the pieces together because they're still investigating the murders that happened on the other side of the lake, which is what Jason did in the last movie. But it seems like the cops always just appear at the end and they're kind of wrap up. Yeah, the latest massacre, but it would have been nice to see a little bit of investigation. They're still over at Packinac checking shit out, you know, checking out Jason's shack and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, that's a good point. I wish I'd put that on the clip list because that would be a good thing uh, to include as a clip to let the listeners and viewers uh, kind of see where Michael Avalon went with that, you know, including the cops and their investigation, because that's a really good point. The other books don't really... Well, we're, we're going to have three clips, and we already have two picked out, so there's a wild card. We could use that for a clip. Yeah, we, we can do four clips total. So, yeah, let's uh, let's do it. Four? I don't even have three yet. Or three. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so that's number one. Okay, roll it. The mutilated corpses of Harry and Edna had left a pall of horror over the police station. Veteran officers, despite the recent spate of slaughters, were once again asking each other, what's going on in this town, who the hell is doing these things, and are we never going to be able to stop him, them? Nobody had the answers to those questions, least of all the chief of police. When the coroner left his office with the ultimate autopsy verdict, and the chief was alone with his thoughts, all he could do was stare out the big windows at the waning sunlight and wonder if this crime wave would cost him his job, as it very well could and might. Election time was coming up again in the fall, and Pinehurst County would be just like any other community when it came to expressing their dissatisfaction with the police chief who couldn't get the job done. The chief of police let out an enormous tired sigh, but one single thought was paramount in his troubled mind. This kind of thing had happened before. Oh, had it ever. Dead, butchered bodies lying all over the countryside. Those murders were still unsolved, still open on the books. And if this were the same maniac and or maniacs, the chief of police shuddered. Suddenly, his office was a very cold place to sit in, and his police chief's chair, very uncomfortable. Uh, 
but yeah, um, it's it's pretty straightforward with the kills. Pretty straightforward going through the motions of this. Now, I, I reread the book. I don't remember any explanation about this. I, I don't think there was in the Simon Hawk version. Is there any explanation about what Jason did to that woman no. in the woods? It's never explained. Like she said that she has this vision of running into the woods away from her parents. And then she got violated by some guy in the woods, but then she blacks out and then wakes up in her own bed and everyone's treating it like she was dreaming. Both novelizations and the movie say that. It is ne- it's is it's implied that it was Jason, but he has never done anything like that before. And also, that he would have had to have att- attacked her long before he made his appearance, killing the counselors with the bag on his head and then putting on the hockey mask. So when would this have happened? Who was that see she uh, clearly sees his face and says that's the guy who attacked me but why would he have done that i think it was written more for this jason the one in this book from the original script because it makes more sense with him because he's not as jason-y <laughs> you know i know that's not a word but he's, he's less not, zombie-like and he's more like some hillbilly hick or something yeah he's not like even he's not even like the the alive jason from two and three really that uh, that we got in the movies the Jason in this book slash the original script was a lot different. So I feel like that whole subplot was written for this version of Jason. And then when they did the rewrite of the movie and we got kind of the Jason, the the Jason we have now, they just kind of kept that subplot there and it just doesn't make sense. Cause even in the book, it's not fleshed out, but at least it fits kind of what this Jason is like more than uh, the Jason that we got in the movie and the, you know, in the Simon Hawk version of the book, uh, if that makes any sense. I know that doesn't clear feel, it up, but. Yeah, I feel like it's like Michael, uh, Halloween 4 with Michael Myers. There's one scene where he's blonde and the next scene he's fine again. There's just, there's never an explanation of why his hair changed color. I think they said they like, they couldn't find the mask or something. So they just said, screw it and threw it on. But you heard it here, folks. If you're blonde, Sean doesn't think that you're okay. But if, you, if you're not blonde, you're fine. Why do I feel like that's an accurate representation of the media? I feel like my words just got, like, completely turned around, and now I'm just like, okay. What you, said. Um, you, said, you said one second he's blonde, the next second he's fine. So uh, let's, let's go on Fox News and, and, and hash this out. Uh, I, I, I'm just going to move on. So... Um, Something, of course, something you want to right. move on. You don't want to talk anymore. I perfectly understand. Okay. It's probably the safest thing you could do. Okay. Let's move on. You're working your way back in a Facebook jail. All right. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Now, now we're going to get to the ending. This is, this is the bulk of what we can talk about. But there is going to be a lot of – there there are going to be – there are going to be a lot of spoilers here. So, I'm, I'm giving everyone a warning. Spoiler alert from this point on. And the show's not over yet. Hold on. We're still going to talk after this about what we think of the movie and the story and the characters. But we just, we're getting all the clips and stuff out of the way. Spoilers here. It's a big difference. Sean is right. Do our countdown. And if you're still listening after this. His eyes were truly mad. The machete raced higher. She stepped back and stumbled, going down to the ground in a full sprawl. Curling his arms upward, Jason prepared for the downward stroke. Chris closed her eyes and waited. All about the barn, the massacred bloody corpses kept silent, vigil, mute witnesses to the carnage that was about to come. Jason growled deep in his throat. His arms came down, the machete swished through the air, and the dead came to life if only for a little time. Blood-soaked, dying Ali, still incredibly alive somehow, rose from the bloody ground and grabbed at Jason. Powerful arms locked about the giant's neck and pulled him down. The machete was checked in its lethal descent. Chris heard the interruption. She opened her eyes, heart throbbing wildly. But the dying Ali was no match for his murderer. Almost gleefully, Jason swung the machete again, It came down on the black man's wrist, chopping off an outstretched hand in one swift stroke. 
Straddling the dying man, Jason went at him with the machete, slashing away unmercifully. Ali died instantly this time, hardly aware of the nightmare he had awakened to. One last powerful thrust, and Fox's man was gone forever. Then Jason turned his attention back to Chris, and got more than even he had ever bargained for. While he had been busy with the black man, she had found a sickle, the only available weapon close at hand. She seized it with all the hatred and determination left in her aching, bruised, tortured body. Jason looked up. His eyes went wide with fear. For a moment, he almost looked human. But it was only an illusion. Chris was running right at him, something shining in her hand. It went aloft and came down with one vicious swiping motion and lopped the mad monster named Jason's head off directly where his neck met his shoulders. Crimson and carmine and vermilion flowed. The huge body flopped, thrashed, and then did not move. It was still. This time, it would not come back to life. It could not. The head lay a few feet away from the body, frozen, faced in death. The ugliness and grotesqueness of the face was monumental. A head for all museums that specialize in horror artifacts. A monster's countenance, a ghoul's. But even in death, Jason had reached out for Chris. The awful hands came at her from a headless body reaching out. But he had finally toppled forever and for all time. Backed against the wall of the stall, Chris stared down at the headless corpse at her feet. She was shaking again. She would never stop shaking. She began to scream again. No! No! The wild wind picked up the word and played with it, tossing it around gleefully as it keened and whimpered in the blackness of the Crystal Lake night. The night and the wind and the dark had truly won their victory, their conquest of the living, and death was the roller of the cottage at Crystal Lake. <laughs> Chapter 12, Abel's Prophecy The sun was high in the sky and white fleecy clouds had the lamb-like look. All in all, a lovely day, despite the local murder sprees which had taken over the countryside. There was little else to think about in the country these days. In the master bedroom of the rustic cottage at Crystal Lake in Pinehurst County, Chris lay in a huge bed, the coverlet tucked up to her chin. Her eyes were blinking erratically from side to side. Her blonde hair lay in limp disarray on the pillow. The night had been hideous for her. She had slept the sleep of the mentally deranged, a fact the man standing at her bedside was quick to note. He was a doctor, and somehow he bore an uncanny resemblance to the old bedraggled bum of Chris's yesterday, Abel, the whiskered weird one. The doctor was holding a glass of water in one hand and a pill in the other. He handed both to Chris with a patient smile. Blankly, she took the objects and used each of them as prescribed. Her brain would not rest. It was too easy to let others do her thinking for her. The door to the room opened softly. The sunlight streaming through the bedroom window reflected on a tall, burly man in a police uniform. Chris blinked again. But she did recognize the chief of police of her town. A good man, a kind man. She had always liked him. But the doctor? About him, she wasn't too sure. When she handed the empty water glass to him, her distrust of the man was all too apparent. The police chief smiled warmly. Everything's just fine now. All taken care of. Your parents are on their way. They should be here by early evening. The doctor, who looked so much like Abel, had taken her unprotesting wrist and was silently checking her pulse. Chris stirred. Something was fighting inside her to be told, but it was all so confusing. The night. The memories. I asked you both about my friends, she quavered in a little girl's voice. I want to know. They're all dead, aren't they? The chief looked at the doctor. The doctor looked at the chief. The doctor was shaking his head, concerned. Chris got angry at that and rallied, plucking at the coverlet with nervous fingers. Do you think I made it all up? She demanded angrily. Why haven't you found them? They're all out there at the cottage, and he killed them all. I killed him! The chief grunted. Best thing for you to do now is get some sleep. Like I told you, everything's just fine. The doctor seemed to agree with that conclusion. He placed Chris's arm gently on the bed. 
Doctor's orders now, he purred. Rest and relaxation, young lady. Just like the chief said, you're going to be just fine. She compressed her lips in a thin line. She didn't say another word. Suspicion, doubt, and confusion dominated her mind, heart, and soul. What was going on here? Why didn't they believe her? It was all so easy to check out, wasn't it? The cottage, the lake, the barn, the broken bridge, the stalled van, the dead bodies all over the place. But she could only watch as the two men exited the room, closing the door softly behind them. Chris's eyes blinked again, side to side, back and forth, to and fro. Nothing seemed quite real to her. Outside in the hallway, behind her closed bedroom door, the chief of police and the doctor talked things over. They were both a little worried. A thing like this could spread to all the other young people in the town. Maybe the older ones, too. You just never knew. I've arranged for the officer to stay around the clock, doctor, just in case there is anything to the poor girl's story. Someone should watch her, all right? In her state of mind, she's liable to do almost anything. The chief eyed him closely, running his forefinger around his nose. What do you think did it, doc? The doctor stared at the closed bedroom door. Hysteria? Too much imagination? She's a lovely young girl, and possible she spent too much time wondering about this maniac or maniacs running loose these days. All these killings and wholesale slaughters. Things like that is bound to prey on the mind, especially of an impressionable young girl like Chris. I'll buy that, the chief nodded briskly. She did have that bad experience a few years back when she ran away from home, if you remember. Just so, and she is tending to relive it. The doctor rubbed his hands again. Well, I'm off. Call me if you need me again, chief. Will do. Thanks for your help, doctor. They both turned to go, passing a young police officer on duty in the living room, sitting in a chair. He rose to acknowledge his superior, and the chief waved at him. The young officer nodded. The doctor and the chief of police made their final farewells to each other and walked out the front door of the house to their respective cars. The man on guard duty went back to his chair. The weather was still beautiful. Sun splashed over the earth, tinging everything with gold. The doctor and the chief drove off, raising dust as they maneuvered down the winding dirt road to the old ramshackle bridge. The setting was still pastoral, still peacefully magnificent. Horror did not belong here. The young officer left on guard duty looked at the watch on his wrist and nodded to himself. He walked toward the bedroom. There was a curious expression on his face, one his chief would not have understood had he been present to see it. The young officer turned the knob of the bedroom door and swung it open. He peered in quietly. Chris was revealed, sleeping calmly on the big bed. Golden sunlight dappled her blonde hair, highlighting the damp tresses. The officer smiled, pleased. The coast was clear. He closed the door softly without so much as a murmur, then crossed on silent feet back to his chair to wait. He knew what his job was, to keep the young female from getting hysterical and going off the deep end again. Considering the mad, wild, and woolly story she told, Jesus... What if the story was true? But it couldn't be true. As soon as the young officer closed the bedroom door, Chris opened her eyes. She waited for a long moment and then sat up listening. When she was sure he was gone and not hiding behind the door, she left the bed. Inserting her bare feet into a pair of slippers, she grabbed her bathrobe lying on the chair close by. She tied the belt tightly about her waist. Slowly tiptoeing, she went to the bedroom door. Her manner and all her movements were as stealthy as a jungle cat, or someone who has come to rob, steal, and kill. She edged open the bedroom door and peered down the hallway. She saw the young officer leaning his head back against the wall, his long legs out in a straddling posture. His eyes were closed. He was already asleep. Chris's smile was something no artist ever could have painted. Like the Mona Lisa, it was an enigmatic, a puzzle, a mystery. Her thoughts at that moment would have been unfathomable. She slipped down the hall like a wraith, turned at the staircase, and glided its length without a whisper of sound. The sleeping young officer did not stir. He was snoring lightly. The house was like a tomb, an unopened tomb. The dust of century seemed to shine in the sunlight, washing the interior. Chris headed for the front door. She tried not to run. 
She was on her way to the barn, where the answers to everything lay, where they had to be, before she went out of her mind completely. <coughs> Chapter 13, Terror Time Again The sun poured into the empty barn, a place now totally barren of all its nightmarish remembrances of the previous night. The normal, everyday objects which filled it, which Chris had always known, were as they always had been, in position, not out of place. The sawhorse, the tools, the storage sheds, the horse stalls, the bells of hay, the piled boxes and crates, nothing was different. The loft ladder stood as it had always stood. The squared loft opening in the second level showed more sunlight streaming in from outside. But Chris's face showed dogged determination, purpose, and resolve. She had to know. She had to be sure. Yet it was intensely bewildering now. She raced, explored feverishly, almost wildly. From the tool shed to the ladder to the haystacks to the tool boxes that were lying on the soft earth. Rummaging, searching, hunting, like a cub looking for its mother. She needed evidence, some kind of proof that it had not all been nightmare and unreality, that she had not dreamed all of it up. Otherwise, she would go mad. She stood in the center of the barn, perplexed and sore of heart, mind, and soul. Her eyes batted furiously. The barn mocked her, somehow, as if all the inanimate objects were laughing at her. "'It can't be,' she muttered aloud. "'Can't be. It happened. I know it did. I saw them. I did. Oh, what is going on here?' She threw her head back as if to clear it of hornets and wasps and dreaded things buzzing around in her brain. The tears started to come again, streaming down her taut face. She fell helplessly to her knees, defeated. There was no answer for her questions. The random sunlight illuminated the haystack rising before her. Something glittered there, like a lost jewel shining, twinkling, iridescent something. She started. Her heart skipped a beat. Glints of red and green were shooting from the haystack, caught by the bright sunlight. She crawled forward on her hands and knees. She focused her wild eyes on the strange, sparkling glow. She moved to the spot on the haystack, her hands going out in a pawing gesture. An odd, dark shape now defined itself as a hand, a human hand. And on its black fingers, red and green gleamed. Rings. Wincing, she picked up the hand, a bloody piece of evidence, of proof. But she remembered the big man coming to life, Jason and his machete chopping off a hand, the savage murder right before her very eyes, right here in this barn last night. She attacked the haystack like a woman possessed, pawing, scraping, ravaging it with eager hands. She did not care what she found, no matter how grisly. Her sanity was at stake, as long as she found something, anything. Her wildest hopes were realized, her greatest horrors proven. She found a human leg, a human foot, and then a mutilated arm lying under the first layer of bloody straw. She probed deeper, her heart in her mouth. The hay gave away. Her numbed fingers unearthed more limbs, more faces, more bodily remains. What was left of Vera, Shelley, Andy, Debbie, Chuck, Chili, and those black strangers, Fox, the woman, and Loco, and Ali, and Derek, poor wonderful Derek. Transfixed, mutely horrified, she dropped the gruesome proof and retreated the way she had come toward the barn door. Yes, she had been avenged, but at what terrible cost. She emitted one last piercing scream and flung herself from the barn of death. The scream followed her all the way up to the house, nestling among the tall old oak trees, echoing like a siren. I found them, she shouted for all the world to hear. In the barn, they're all dead. Help me, help me. The young sleeping officer must have heard her. The front door of the house was swinging wide when she got there, throwing herself at the door, still screaming and pounding. Open the door! I found the bodies! Let me in! Help! Please let me in, can't you? The door pulled back, opening wide. A huge shadow stood there. Jason. His arm drew back, coming down from on high. Something glittered in the dazzling sunlight of the new day. Chris started to scream again, but not before the machete lopped off her head, bringing the nightmare full circle. <laughs> Chapter 14 The Beginning Come as Death 
The young officer left on duty in the house yawned awake. Guiltily, he looked at his watch. He had been catnapping for a good hour. He got up from his chair, stretched, and walked toward the master bedroom. There was a curious expression on his face. He reached for the doorknob. He turned it lightly, gently, and opened the door. He peered into the room once more as he had before and saw the young girl sleeping peacefully on the big bed. All right, so Jason gets beheaded with a freaking sickle. <laughs> what? <laughs> Fucking I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking like dumb and dumber. What? He didn't even have a head. Harry, I took care of it. Oh, he just like duct, duct taped it back on. He was getting old anyways. <laughs> he was getting old anyways. Uh, Jason was getting up. The killer's heads are falling off. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, yeah whole, but... the whole scene is different. You know, everything that leads up to it and the aftermath of the scene. Uh, he gets decapitated. And then you think that was a dream. And Jason decapitates her. And that's what that that was the dream. That's the weird part. Like there's no uh Pamela coming out of the water, zombie Pamela pulling her down out of the canoe. Instead, in her version of, in the dream in the book, uh Jason is still alive, chases her out of the house and cuts her head off. Uh but it's just a dream. She had already decapitated Jason. But uh you know, Foxy and them had a little more fun with Jason in this book, too. But it seemed their deaths were a little more brutal. And uh, the way Jason talked or thought about them and stuff, it makes me wonder about uh, the way she died. If that wasn't something Jason was, like, purposely picking that way or something. But it's weird because not only does she decapitate Jason, but she wakes up in her bed again and the cops are like, Oh, it was just a dream. I, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, we're, we're going to send you someplace to get help. But then he talks to the doctor and he's like, yeah, make sure she doesn't know about any of that shit that happened. Yeah. And she, she sneaks past the guard, goes back to the barn, finds all the bodies that have been hidden. And she's like, w is this a cover up or what? And then at the very end of the book, they arrest that old guy with the eyeball. I, I think they're trying to pin it on him at the yeah, end. It, it doesn't make like, any sense. You know why? You know why they're going to arrest him? Because he's a fucking bum, Alice. He's a fucking bum. It just, it, it doesn't make sense, Sean. Like, the whole, if they're going to cover up, why just hide the bodies in the hay? You know? Why not throw them in the back of the cruiser or something and drive them somewhere else? There's no well, dead bodies here. Oh, uh, don't mind those fingers sticking through the hay over there. Well, there was a guard at her door. She went out the window because the guard was inept. Yeah, but whose job was it to stuff the bodies in the hay, bear, the hay bells and stuff, you know? I mean, what the hell? It doesn't, that, that part confused the shit out of me when she starts finding the body parts and stuff. Some of them are like stashed. Uh, Jason didn't have a didn't, did, 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 Didn't your mom ever tell you to sweep and you didn't want to fucking do it, so you just swept it all under the rug? That's, That's what It's kind of the same thing. That's what they did with the bodies. And yeah, they're just they're just gonna bodies in the hay. Died. I'm sure it's fine. Why did they not want her to know that he was dead? I, I don't understand that either. You think that that would be? He's dead, ma'am. You're okay. He's not going to come back. Well, they make their they they. It sounds like from their discussion, they were trying to make her think that she's crazy and just lock her up. And I'm like, what is that going to do for anybody? Uh, doesn't really make any sense. Especially, I mean, because it, it's not like Jason disappeared, died. Yeah, it, it's it's not like he was some escaped experiment that they're trying to keep secret. You know, he was a murderer. He killed some people. He got his head butt cut off. I mean, right? What that whole thing doesn't <clears throat> make any sense. That makes even less sense than the whole Jason raping people thing. You know, so yeah, that that was a very confusing part of it. Um, but like all this, in all, this... no, go ahead. No, I feel like the third's always been kind of the one of the weaker ones of the series for me. It's just, there's a lot of inconsistencies with it. I don't like a lot of the characters and just, I've never been a big fan of this book, but I was kind of interested because there, there's two versions of this book and the Simon Hawk one's kind of interesting because, you know, he wrote, he did one, two, and three. So he he carried a lot of the Jason's thoughts 
into those or you know and and that one but i'm talking like as far as like up yeah. to three but this standalone one even if it's based on an earlier script i it didn't really make it that much better for me um it's still not one of my favorite front of the 13th um no it's it's actually this is gonna get me a lot of shit Part eight and part three are my least favorites. Right there. I said it. Part two's up there too. So is part one. Not at the very end, but like in my lower tier Friday the thirteenth films, you're gonna find one, two, three, and eight. Uh Jason X and Jason Goes to Hell, uh New Blood, those movies, they're up towards the top. So uh that's an unpopular opinion, but that's just what I like. So sue me, but I, this, this book, we've kind of covered most of the differences. There's still some subtle differences. It's definitely worth checking out just to say you checked it out. Cause I mean, it's not very often ghostbusters is another example where there's two versions of the novelization for a movie. Uh, kind of like how exorcist four has two versions of exorcist four, the movie. Uh, two scripts, two different directors, all that. Uh, it's worth checking out just for um, the novelty aspect of it. And Jason doesn't wear a hockey mask in this book. He's killing people while wearing like a see-through white mask sort of thing that you'd get at the dollar store for a buck at Halloween, like the cheapest Halloween mask you can come up with. Uh, the deaths are written pretty well, though. I will give it that. Uh, it was pretty gory. Uh, they go a little more in depth. Some of the deaths are slightly different. Uh, the scene with Shelly uh, and what's her, I can't remember her name. Uh, they go to the store and he knocks over the bikes and everything. Uh, he was a little more, I don't, I don't recall. He was a little more of a badass in this version of the book. Not, I'm not calling him a badass. I'm saying he's a little bit closer to that side than the other uh, in this book. He's got a little more of an attitude. Uh, but it's never been my favorite movie, not my favorite book by any stretch of the imagination. I will say Michael Avalone had a better pacing ability with his writing because Simon Hawk does this thing where he needs to fill pages. So he'll do pointless backstory, uh, like pages and pages of it, where I feel like I'm in a Especially secret- the, the guy that the, the guy with the gut in the beginning that gets killed. It went into like he, he was like an ex base uh, football player, and Edna met him because he was like the MVP of the school. And I'm just like, what does any of this have to do with anything? <laughs> oh my god, it's like it's like uh, in Simon Hawk's Friday the Thirteenth Part One, uh, he couldn't talk about Pamela being the killer because that was the surprise at the end. Even though anybody reading the book already knew that, so his hands were kind of tied. So he couldn't do a lot of what he did in parts two, three, and six, where, you know, you get in the head of Jason and get some of his backstory and what he's thinking. He couldn't do that in the first one. He couldn't give you any hint of the killer. So instead, he gave you, like, chapters of backstory on characters right before they die. You know, it's like they get in bed together. Then you get their backstory for 10 pages. And then when you come back, Jason or uh, Pamela's killing them. Um, but yeah, this book. Well, I remember in the isn't like that. I remember in the first book, some guy was talking about alligators in the sewer, and I swear it went on for like three pages. I'm like, get to the point, man. But I think the reason he had to do that in the first one, and when we talk about that book, uh, maybe we'll go into detail about that. I think the reason he had to do that was because he couldn't give us like the pages of like what Jason or Pamela is thinking. Because he had to play by the rules of the movie and not reveal who the killer is, you know. Uh, in part two and three and six, he didn't have to do that. But Michael uh, was able to pace the story better. I'm not saying he's a better author or writer or storyteller by any stretch of the imagination. The Simon Hawk version is definitely superior to this version. But this one does have better pacing. And it's a nice novelty piece just to say you've read it. Kind of like Death Moon. Actually, this one's way better than Death Moon, but Death Moon is like the Jason X book you listen to or read just so you can say you did it and you're done with it. You read or listen to, the, to Friday the 13th 3D by Michael Avalone to say you did it and you move on. So that's my thoughts on it. I'd give this book uh, three out of five stars just because the uniqueness of it 
and it's something we wouldn't have got to experience if he hadn't written it. So, yeah, I'd I'd give it about that. It's it's the same story, but it's got enough twists and turns to where it doesn't exactly feel the same. I you know I was kind of interested in some of the places that it went because there's actually like news reports in this book of what's going on around the main character. So that's kind of what I want in a novelization. I want it to be close to the movie, but I want there to be enough differences of like deleted scenes, uh, different paths they were going to take. Because if if it's a straight copy of the movie, what's the point? I mean, it's different. I guess if you can't see the movie and you're reading the book and you want to have the visuals in your head, but there has to be, I'd like there to be some differences. And Shelley actually got a death scene in the book. So instead of just going into the barn and screaming. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Three out of five, definitely. Um, the cast would pretty much be the same. I think they casted them pretty pretty accurately. Uh, but, yeah, that's uh, Friday the 13th, 3D by Michael Avalon. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add before we close it out? No, I'm I'm pretty good on that. All right. Uh, if you're a patron, be sure to join us on After the Slash for a little 30-minute discussion on whatever the fuck we think up. Uh, it's always a lot of fun. Hope you'll join us. If you're not a patron already, you can sign up for a dollar a month. A uh, dollar a month, uh, $2, $5, 10 15 or 50 They all come with different rewards, and you'll be supporting the channel, keeping it going and growing for years to come. I'm not able to monetize it on YouTube. I depend on that Patreon to keep the channel going. I uh, got a lot of stuff going on the channel now. We got the narrations. We got the podcast here. We got we got slash tracks. Our mystery science theater homage, uh, new series. Uh, the second episode started up today. Retro horror gaming, and pretty soon, uh, Sean is actually going to be a part of this too. Me, Sean, Slasher Pepper, and Alex from Slash Tracks are going to have a debate show where we debate horror topics. Uh, where two of us are debating one side of a topic, two are debating the other, like uh, PG-13 horror movies, good or bad. Two of us will debate good, two will debate bad. We have rounds, opening arguments, opinions, closing arguments, and you guys in the comments will get to pick who won. Uh, It's going to be called Hashing the Slash. That's coming sometime uh, early next year, and I hope you enjoy that too. But yeah, that's going to be it for tonight. Uh, This has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for watching. Be excellent to each other and have a happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you soon. This is Sean Campbell saying bye. Oh, if this one doesn't scare you, bye. Oh, that was my catchphrase. I forgot. It's been a long time. (laughs) You can do it real quick. (laughs) Hmm. Take two. And this is Sean Campbell saying, if this one doesn't scare you, I can't see a thing. (laughs) Into the room once more as he had before, and saw the young girl sleeping peacefully on the big bed. The golden sunlight was still touching the damp blonde hair, making it radiant to see. He waited only a second longer, nodded to himself, and then closed the door again. All was well. The juicy blonde was okay for the time being. Everything was still cool. The smile on Chris's face was almost angelically serene. The young officer was pleased. This job was going to be a snap. No sweat at all. (laughs) Chapter 15. The Devil's Keeper Ed Harris, station KLTZ's early morning reporter, was back on the job that day. Indeed, all of Pinehurst's bewildered and terrified citizenry wanted to know all they could and more about the crime wave circulating in the county. Hell, if a maniac was on the loose and people were getting slaughtered like flies, it was high old time the police department got on the ball and caught the person or persons responsible. What were people paying taxes for? The breezy Harris, however, had little of note and interest to offer his listeners. It seemed the authorities had made very little progress since the horrible discovery of two more victims in their marketplace store and home. The details of the massacre of Harry and Edna was topic A in Pinehurst County. 
All folks could do was lock their doors, watch out for strangers, and hope the killer or killers would be caught real soon. Never had so many phone calls been made to KLTZ Switchboard in its entire history on the air. Harris did have one bit of new information, nonetheless. In a calmer voice with some lightness in the tone, he delivered the following tidbit to his anxious and nervous audience. Local police arrested a man today who was walking on the back roads behind Crystal Lake, calling himself only Abel. The man is an obvious vagrant. He was wearing old hand-me-down clothes and is somewhat of a Bible quoter. He is a tall man with full white whiskers and his eyes are unusually bright. Officials estimate he is well over 70, but he is by no means feeble. It took three officers to bring him into custody. Authorities are holding him for further investigation. As of now, no one knows the suspect's true identity. The only note of interest here is that when in custody, the old man kept saying over and over again, It is judgment day. The time has come. Repent, ye sinners, and I will take you to him who will save us all. Unquote. And now, turning to the local sports action today, all Pinehurst County shuddered. What was going on in their peaceful little community? Only Chris knew and nobody was listening to her.